open your Bible, if you would, to Numbers chapter 1. We're going to take a look at really a time to organize as we pick up chapter 1. It is definitely a different type of a book to teach. You look on the internet, there's probably four studies on the internet. There's not very many books in the book of Numbers. So I'm kind of challenged to really sit here and say, God, give me something. Well, he did, I think, today in a very powerful way. But the book opens really with an army. And that's kind of interesting to me. When you look at the book of Genesis, it deals with really a new beginning or really God creating man. And then you go to the book of Exodus and we find that God is now redeeming man by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then you come to the book of Leviticus and you get to a point of God bringing people close to him in a life of worship. Well, then it makes sense to me that the book of Numbers has to deal with a war, an army that you have to maintain what God has done in your life. You're going to have to make a stand, and you're going to have to really put your foot down and discipline your life because you're now in the army of God. And God has enlisted you, and God said to Paul that once again he was apprehended for this moment, that he would begin to show the great things that God had done in his life, and he was going to suffer, but to endure hardness as a good soldier. So when I look at this, it begins now to make a little bit of sense that the book of Numbers has to deal with two major numberings. One was the old generation, and the second is the second generation. And it's kind of interesting. It's only about 200,000 off. And so there's about 600,000 plus of the old generation that was going to die and a whole other generation that was going to go into the promised land. Out of the old generation, only two made it in, Caleb and Joshua because of the sin of their life, the sin that the others committed, and Joshua and Caleb believed in God. And so they walked around the wilderness for 39 years. And so you have to remember that this book is about 39 uh, years long. It has to deal with not making any progress whatsoever. It's going around and around and around in circles. And finally, God begins to speak in that wilderness experience if you're willing to hear what he has to say. So they're walking aimlessly. And Israel had been complaining about the food. And Korah, you remember, was complaining about the leadership. Miriam and Aaron were complaining about Moses' uh, marriage. And so there was no growth. There was nothing going on. So it's a time, I think, really the word of the Lord is the time for us to grow up. We are living in absolutely perilous times. And these are times that I believe that we can't be crybabies or whiners or complainers. I think it's now time for God's people to really grab and take hold of what God wants to do. I think it's no longer can we just sit around and do nothing. And so there's a cute little poem I I came across. The fight is on, O Christian soldier, face to face in stern array, with armor gleaning and banners steaming the right and wrong engaged today the fight is on but we're not weary be strong and in his might hold fast if god be for us his banner over us we will sing the victory song at last and that's what he's talking about it's time for us to prepare it's time for us to once again equip and it's time for us to begin to walk in victory in our life so four things really kind of stood out to me in chapter one Number one, the first thing I see is there's a need for God's Word. There's a need for God's Word. If there's ever a time, and you think, well, now wait a second, the Word is being going out. It's not. There's a famine in the land, and people are not hearing the Word of God. Very few churches are talking about the Word of God. And when you begin to have the Word of God, people begin to get on fire for God. So the great need of our life is for God's Word to speak. Notice in verse 1. Of chapter 1. And the Lord spake to Moses in the wilderness. Underline that. That's all you have to do. When you are in the wilderness, God will speak to you. When you are going through the pit, God will speak to you. When you are going through a divorce, God will speak to you. There's not a time in your life that God will not speak. In the tabernacle of the congregation, when you come to church, God needs to speak to you. God is willing to speak. His word is willing to be there. On the first day of the second month, in the second year after they came out of the land of Egypt, saying. So the first thing I realize is God's incredible grace. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 2, there's a great verse. He says, Thus saith the Lord, The people which were left on the sword 
found grace in the wilderness. Did you check that out? They found grace in the wilderness. You think, now wait a second. You mean the wilderness is a horrible experience? Yes. But there is grace in the wilderness. Shigrat, Meshach, and Abednego found Christ in the furnace. So it's possible to once again have a desire to see God and hear God in the most difficult times of your life. But you have to want it. You have to say enough of this moaning and groaning and crying. I need the Word of God to dictate to my life. I need strength right now. I need to grow up and begin to hang out. I need to realize I stand alive ministering and those have gone before me, so be it. But I'm here now. I need to be a strength to my kids. I need to be a strength to my husband. I need to be a strength to the church. I need to get my life together. That's really the Word of God to our life in this book of Numbers. It means to be stand up and be counted for the glory of God. And here to find grace. And God's incredible Word, you remember what we said last week in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. He says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for, number one, doctrine, Number two, for reproach. Number three, or reprove, I should say. Number three, for correction. And number four, for instruction in righteousness. And the reason why? That you may be perfect or complete or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the purpose of God is to bring you His Word. Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 1, God's incredible gift. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in time past and to the fathers by the prophets. But in verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heirs of all things, by also he made the world. Now check out verse 3. Being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he has himself purged our sin, set down at the right hand of majesty. In verse 3, being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, he had made himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of majesty on high. Now that's a great verse. And that's what God is saying. Listen, I don't want you in this wilderness any longer than you need to be here. So I have a plan. I want you out. And I have a goal in your life. I want you to go into the land of Canaan. I want you to occupy the land that I've given to you, that milk and honey, where you're going to see great things going on in your life. And so often we look at Canaan like, oh, it's heaven. No. In the hymn books, it's heaven, but really not. When they went into Canaan, they had all kinds of problems and enemies attacking them and warfare and all kinds of conflict. If that's heaven, I don't want to go. Heaven means it's over. It's done. I'm with Jesus Christ. The battle's won. No more battles in my life. So Canaan would be a spiritual time in my life. In other words, I'm here in the wilderness dying, but now I'm in the battle fighting for my life, but I'm happy in the will of God. So I have two choices. I can stay where I'm at and be out of God's will, or I can be involved and be in God's will. Either way is a battle. So number one, there is a need for God's Word to explode to our lives and the people around us, and He'll do that. God will do that in a very profound way. He says He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And though He gives you the Word, you have to take it. And sometimes we don't take it. He's made a way of escape for every one of us, but sometimes we don't want that way, and we have to take it. Secondly, the second thing I see here is a word for God's people. Not only is God speaking in the wilderness, but God has a word for me and God has a word for you. In other words, check it out. Verse 2, take ye to the sum total. Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel. In other words, get them all together. I want you to bring them all together. And here the children of Israel after their family And after the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their pole. Now today in Israel, when you travel, some of you have seen it. Women get on buses who are 19, 20 years old with Uzis. And they just ride the buses with Uzis. They take those things home. Once you've given an Uzi, you keep it for the rest of your life. They have an automatic army ready to go at any time. But at 20 years old, men and women have to go in and they... Once again, you see it, and it's kind of a neat thing when you go on a bus, all these Uzis on there with you. 
And so you kind of think, well, and, you know, Raul Reese was messing around with one of them, you know, talking to the gal. And I'm saying, Raul, just be quiet before she shoots you, you know. And so anyway, but take heed to some total. In Romans, we said last week in chapter 15, verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of Scripture might find hope. So what he's saying here is that, listen, I'm going to show you my word, but I'm also going to give you my word. I want you to gather together the congregation. Bring the assembly together. I want to give you a whole bunch of people in leadership. And I want you to take the 12 that you have over the 12 tribes, and also there's one out of each of the tribe that is a renowned person who is absolutely blessed. He is going to come by your side, Moses, and help you in this endeavor. So God has leadership. God wants to do something. God wants to get you out of where you're at. You know, there's a time I came home from Costa Mesa. I was tired, exhausted. I had been with Pastor Chuck, and we had been in Arizona. We flew into Arizona and dedicated two churches, spoke at two different places. On the way back, we flew into Orange County and got in about, oh, 10.30 or so at night. So I came home, and, you know, I was tired. Gail was in bed, and I just hopped in bed. And I, I heard this voice saying, are you going to spend a little bit of time with me? And I said, no, I'm going to bed. I'm tired, God. Enough's enough. And the Lord said, okay. And I just like, it was like so vivid. Well, I was going to share with you something, but never mind. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I turned my light on. Now here I am. God, I, you have my attention. I have a pencil and paper. What do you want to do? So I just opened to Isaiah 54. And I was been tossing back and forth. Do we buy this place? Do we don't buy this place? What do we do? And God gave this to me in like just two minutes. And it changed my life forever. In Psalm 54, Isaiah 54, verse 1, he said, Sing, O barren, thou dost not bear. In other words, Stephen, it's time for you to start worshiping, singing. I know you don't have a building you own, but you're going to. Break forth into singing. Cry aloud, thou that did not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married. In other words, Steve, over in this area, I'm going to bless you. This is where I want you in a cross-culture ministry. I'm going to bless your life. I want you to worship and begin to thank God. I said, okay, that's okay. Secondly, he said in verse 2, I want you to start enlarging the area. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Make it bigger. And then stretch forth the curtain of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cord. Strengthen thy stakes. In other words, there are going to be people come by your side that's going to help you really minister by your side, but I want you to drive the stake deep into the Word of God. And I want you to put the rope on absolutely tight because what I'm going to do, you got to be ready for it. I'm saying, okay, okay, okay. And then the big thing, do I move or do I not move? And here it was in verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand, on the left hand. You think, oh, Steve, come on, you're tired. No, this is what the Lord said. You're going to break forth on the right hand of the 110 freeway and on the left hand of the 110 freeway. Oh, oh wow, I never saw that. And then, of course, it wasn't there, 110, but I saw it there. And then, thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, make desolate the cities. In other words, you are going to come over here, and no one, you're not going to lose anybody. And lastly, in verse 4 and 5, fear not, Stephen, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Well, God, I don't want to make a mistake. Neither be thou confounded. I'm really messed up. For thou shalt not be put to shame. I kind of am. For thou shalt for Get the shame of thy youth and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. For thy maker is thy husband, Stephen. The Lord of hosts is his name, Stephen. The Redeemer of the Holy One of Israel, Stephen. I am the God of the whole earth, Stephen. Okay, okay, got it. Can I go to bed now? And I remember that I wrote this down, went to bed, woke up in the morning, and I thought it was a dream, and I saw my notes, and I thought, I can't believe it. And so we moved, and we bought the place. And all of a sudden, everything came about. So, you know, in that wilderness, I, I know God's there, but God wants me to hear it. And it's the word of the living God. And it begins to build. And so we build and build and build and build. But number three, not only there's a need for the word and there's a word for God's people, but check it out. There is a war to be fought. 
There's a war to be fought. And verses 3 and 4. For 20 years and owed upward, all are able to go forth to war in Israel. Thou, Aaron, shall number them by their armies. With you there shall be a man of every tribe, every one ahead, house of the fathers. In other words, are you ready to fight? Now here's the problem. I In the wilderness, and so I know God's there, but I'm not taking heed to the word. I finally hear the word. What does God want me to do? Get out of the wilderness. Get organized. Okay, now I'm out. Now what? I want you to get ready for battle. I don't want you to lose or go backwards. Well, what am I going to have to do? You're going to have to get strong. You're going to have to really understand what you're up against. I gave you my word to make you strong. And so Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. Are you there? Are you really strong? Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're not going to run any longer. And be able to withstand the devil. Ye wrestle not against flesh and blood at home, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So at work, in your mind, in your heart, these are spiritual battles you're going through. Check out verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day. There's a day coming that's going to try to take you out but you're going to be able to make it because you're going to stand. Having done all to stand, do you hear it? And verse 10, stand strong. And verse 11, stand. And verse 13, having done all to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and then have the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And take the shield of faith, which is able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy, and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer, supplication, and watching. In other words, you now are going to be aggressive. You're going to be a warrior. You're not going to be just in the wilderness bummed out. But now you're going to have the Word of God there, the Word of God in your heart, and the Word of God is going to be built in your heart. Why? So you are a great husband, and you are a great wife, and you are a great parent. In other words, no more messing around. Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. Listen to what he said, training in faith. Joshua, in chapter 1, verse 5, There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Did he believe it? No. Well, how do you know that, Steve? Well, look at verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Okay, great, got it. No, you really don't have it. Verse 7, only be thou strong and very courageous. You need to be strong and courageous. Okay, got it. No, not yet. Verse 9, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage? Don't be afraid, neither be thou dismayed. (laughs) I guess I am. Well, not only, look at verse 18, only be strong and of good courage. Guess what? Do you think he believed it? No. Do you believe, think that God wanted him to believe it? Absolutely. Do you think that there was a word for him? Yes. What was the word? Join the army. Be part of what God's doing. Be an answer. Not a problem. Stand in the army and be part of what God's doing. You need to grow up. That's what he's saying. Very powerful. Oh, I'm just nobody. Can't believe how terrible things really are, you know. Listen, you are an army. You've been in that wilderness, and the word of the Lord came and said, listen, I'm here. My grace is here. And not only that, I have a word for you that's going to break you out of this. And you're going to hang on to it. And then you're going to realize that now you need to use the word of God and be strong in the Lord. And lastly, the fourth thing I see is there's a worship we must do. Worship we must do. It says here, the Levites in the tabernacle. Levites must bear it. Verse 50. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, and over the vessels thereof, over all things that belong to it. They share, bear the tabernacle. All the vessels thereof, they shall minister to it, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. They were not to go out to war. They were not even to be counted. They did not even have the ability to have homes or whatever. They were not to have anything for their possession. God was now going to be their possession. 
They were going to stay close to the tabernacle. They were responsible for building it, setting it up, breaking it down, making sure everything was together. So you had people that were out in warfare. You had people who were out working. And then you had people who were worshiping. Everyone's important. And then we read here in, in Leviticus chapter 51, not only that, but when the tabernacle set forward, the Levites shall take it down. So guess what? They had to take it down. They had to set it up. They had to take it down. And then you look at verse 51. He says here, the Levites shall set it up. Interesting. They had to bear it. They had to break it down. They had to set it up. And inside, we'll see tonight, there are three families. One family was connected to the furniture. Another family was connected to, you know, the, the instruments. And another family was in, uh, connected to setting the thing up. No wonder you see the Jewish people in furniture so often. There they are. They're always doing something. But they were responsible. So it's kind of cool when you think about this. You know, when I was in Alaska, gone fishing, uh, it was a great time, one time in a lifetime, pretty expensive, but I went with Azusa Pacific and some of the people there, the leaders, and we were out fishing. I did pretty well. I caught like three halibuts, 150 pounds. It was great. But when I came back, it was even better because I came back to a room that there was homemade bread. Sounds real good right now. Homemade biscuits. There was shrimp, and there was lobster, and there was salmon, and it was sautéed, and, and it was like, I can still see it right now. It was like, this is where it's at. I'm fishing, and now I'm eating. It doesn't get any better than this. And so I thought, what would happen if I came back from fishing all day, and there was a can of Vienna sausage? Say, Enjoy yourself, Steve. It break my heart. So they were busy working in the kitchen. That's what I have to do. I have to prepare dinner. I have to food, feed dinner. I have to spread dinner. I have to entice you, Chateaubriand, lobster, everything. I got to go to church. I got to hear the word. Why? That's where it's at. And then notice he says here in verse 52, the Levites had to live right here at the word. The children of Israel shall pitch their tent, every man by his own camp. And every man by his own standard, we're going to talk about that tonight, throughout their camp. There are three uh, tribes on the north, three tribes on the south, three tribes on the east, and so on. And here they were pitching, but, verse 53, but the Levite shall pitch round about the tabernacle, the testimony. They had to live close to God. And when they got away from God, everything fell apart. Notice that there be no wrath upon the congregation. What are you talking about? Well, when the congregation demands that the worship people begin to do certain things, they're not going to do what God wants them to do. Then the work is going to be messed up and the warfare is going to be against us. But if we're doing what God wants us to do and doing the pulpit right, everything else comes together. Everything comes together. And so the Word of God is going to be lifted up. And that's what we're to do. And so often, yes, I can do the building project, but I don't want to do it no more. Yes, I can build. God's given me this incredible gift, but I don't want to do it because it's now a sinful thing in my life. And so I want to get out of it. I, I don't want to do it because it pulls me away at my age and with all the studies and everything else, that's why we're all going to jump in and knock this thing out because I'm just not going to do it. I made my mind up. I'm not going to do it. I did what I had to do. I designed it, did everything I can, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get involved in it because it's just not God's will in my life. If I stay close to God's will, David went out, and they came to David, and they said, David, we don't want you going out to battle anymore. Why? At least the light of Israel be quenched. I need to stay really close to God and hear what God wants to do. He says in verse 54, the children of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded. And here in Deuteronomy 18, verse 5, the Lord thy God has chosen him out of all the tribe to stand to minister in the name of the Lord. So when I look at this, I begin to realize there are four things that really, really, really stand to me. Number one, I'm in this horrible moment of my life. Well, let me tell you, God's with you. He'll never leave you, nor will he forsake you. That word is there. He has been speaking and showing and sending and working in and through your life. But number two, there is a word for you today that God has something He wants to do in and through your life. And it's not to condemn you. It's to build you up, to make you strong. And there is a war going on right now 
that you have to be victorious in. You have to get victory. You have to walk in victory. And lastly, there is a moment of worship that you cannot stop, but you need to learn to worship God with everything in your heart and stay close to the very center of God's will, that center. And so tonight we're going to see the Shekinah glory. And there are three tents or three tribes. Their tents were facing the Shekinah glory. Another three tribes they were facing. Another three tribes were facing. Another three tribes. And Moses and Aaron and all the priests were right next to the Shekinah glory. That's what God wants. Because now everything works. But take the priest out and take the people out and stop the worship because we've got too much work. It's all going to crash in. And that's what churches do. How can we worship now? we got work to do. No, you cannot afford not to worship. You have to worship. You have to get here and worship God with all your heart, with all your mind. So let me tell you this. There's a word, and there's a word for you. And God wants you to be strong. Because you have been engrafted or apprehended into an army. And God wants you and needs you. 